Hey everyone, welcome back to our series, Key Battles in World War I. And in the previous episode, we looked at the Battle of Verdun, and it went on and 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 on. Do I need to say a few more and ons, James, to really get the sense of how long this went on? I think some people probably felt the episode went on and on. <laughs> There's really no short way to do it. I mean, how are you going to make a battle short that is one day short of 300 days? 56 day wars fit in there. 100 Gettysburgs fit in there. This is a battle, people. It, not a campaign, not a war, but a battle. But we did it. So in this episode, we're going to be looking at the naval war of World War I and the Battle of Jutland. And maybe people don't think of a naval war. They think of trenches, the Red Baron, other aspects of World War I. But the war of, at sea is crucial. The Germans use their submarines against commerce to threaten the Allied war effort. But it's the naval war that eventually draws the United States into the conflict. We're going to be looking at economic blockades. The British blockade of Germany, afforded by the Royal Navy's command of the sea, inflicts huge damage on Germany. And it had incredible ramifications for the future because many of the practices used in the First World War are pursued in the Second World War. So very significant. To do the war justice, we can't forget this. So start us off, James. Introduce us to the naval war. All right, we're going to start, we're going to go back a few years and talk about the factors that led up to the naval war in World War I. So for centuries, as most people know, Great Britain had enjoyed the largest and the most powerful navy in the world. They even had a song, Rule Britannia, and Britannia rules the waves, and they really did. But in the early years of the 20th century, and even late in the late 1800s, the German Kaiser Wilhelm embarked on a naval buildup designed to challenge Britain's supremacy. He didn't he wanted to also rule the waves or at least some of them, right? And Wilhelm was a little bit crazy in some ways. He he thought Britain would be impressed. <laughs> and oh, wow, you look at that amazing navy you're whipping up there. Yeah, let's be buddies. He thought the the British would do that, which is of course the exact opposite of what Britain did. Britain basically said, what are you doing? You, you can't do that. We are the boss of the waves, not Germany. So, and you're not going to, we're going to slap you down. I thought a little arms race would make us buds. Come on, Britain. Yeah. So again, another example of a little bit of insanity on the part of <laughs> Wilhelm, not literal insanity, but just foolishness. And you know, Britain had had battleships for quite some time, but in 1906, something happened that completely changed the face of naval warfare, and that is Britain built a new type of battleship, and they named it the HMS, that means Her Majesty's Ship, Dreadnought. The Dreadnought was a behemoth. It was massive. It was larger. It was more powerful, and it was faster than previous battleships. It had guns like out the wazoo. It could blow the crud out of any other ship existing at that time. And others were soon built. In fact, they named a whole class of ships after the Dreadnought. So it was a, not just one ship now, but a Dreadnought class. And this made all pre-1906 battleships obsolete. So if you had a really great battleship in 1905, maybe the best in the world, in 1906, it's, it's a piece of junk. <laughs> and here's a fun fact. I can't, as, a, as a Texan, I can't resist pointing this out. All right. So... There, today, in the year 2020, when we're recording this, there is only one remaining Dreadnought-class battleship in the entire world. Well, Scott has the notes in front of him, so <laughs> Scott is not allowed to answer this question. But here you go, listener. I'm going to ask the listener, where do you think it is? Where is this Dreadnought battleship? Obviously, it's not being used. It's really, really old, but it's kind of like a museum piece. All right, I didn't hear the correct answer. I think I heard some people say Britain... No, nope, uh, wrong listeners. It is in Houston, Texas. It's the battleship Texas, which fought in World War I and a little bit in World War II in desperate need of repair, and they're about to spend a lot of money and repair it. But, I mean, it's probably, Scott, uh, 15, 20 minutes from my house, so until they move it, that is. But, and I've been there before. I went there as a kid. Every kid goes on a field trip to the battleship Texas in the Houston area at some point. It's pretty cool. But anyway, it's kind of fun that Houston has the only remaining dreadnought. All right. So the dreadnought changes naval warfare. Prior to the war, the British also developed another type of ship called the battle cruiser. 
Battle cruisers combined the power of battleships, which of course are the largest type of ship at the time, or naval ship anyway, with the speed of cruisers who are kind of like mini battleships. They're smaller. They're the second biggest ship around at the time. That is until they invent battle cruisers. So a battle cruiser is a compromise between a battleship, a big massive behemoth, and a cruiser, which is a faster, lighter ship. But these battle cruisers were not as heavily armored as battleships. Their designers said their speed will be their armor. In other words, they're so much faster than a battleship, they'll get away before you can blow them to bits. And we're going to see how that works a little bit later. Now, what was Britain's war goal? Their goal was to bottle up the German Navy in port. Geography worked in their favor. Obviously, Britain is an island, and it's completely surrounded by water, and it has a lot of good natural harbors. And Britain is able to move their ships pretty much wherever they want. But Germany has to have theirs uh, in on the coast of Germany, obviously. And, they, and if, if they're going to get out into the world, they have to go by Great Britain and British ships. So Germany is at a big disadvantage geographically. The main British fleet was called the Grand Fleet. Remember that, everybody, because it's going to be a little confusing. The main German fleet is called the High Seas Fleet. That's pretty optimistic. <laughs> but the Grand Fleet, the main British fleet, was stationed at Scapa Flow. Scapa Flow is an amazing natural harbor in the Orkney Islands, which are off the coast of Scotland, far to the north. Uh, this fleet would, but if you get a chance, listener, I want you to go and just Google Scapa Flow and look at how beautiful this place is. There's also a great BBC documentary on there, and Scott and I, Scott and I will give you all a list of all the movies and the shows and the documentaries we mentioned, but uh, and the books too. But anyway, the fleet's job, the Grand Fleet's job at Scapa Flow was to keep German ships from going north of the North Sea. British also, uh, Britain also had the English Channel heavily mined, so that's pretty much closed to Germany. So Germany's got a major problem. They need to do something desperate. They kind of need to roll the dice, they feel. Now, the French fleet was also uh, obviously the junior partner of the Allies, but they their job was to monitor the Western Mediterranean. So that's the situation. Ger Germany is starting out with really two strikes against them already, wouldn't you say, Scott? It's not pretty. And I want to mention a few other things here about the larger aims of the Allies and Central Powers, because you see something similar happening uh, with to Germany's plan before World War I, where they're working for years and years and years on uh, a plan that would involve going into France, knocking them out of the war, and then attacking Russia. But that's not the reality of World War I. It doesn't unfold that way. Something similar is happening with naval strategy. Uh, with the Allies and the Central Powers, what they envisioned is the idea of a decisive fleet encounter between the powers at sea. I don't know, a battle of Midway, I suppose. Uh, this idea came from the writings of Alfred Thayer Mahan, uh, who lived from 1840 to 1914. And he wrote the book, Influence of Sea Power on History. And he emphasized the need for the construction of battle fleets based on battleships to destroy an enemy force. So the strategies produced by the two sides work to achieve this end, uh, especially with their naval buildup, but with the dreadnought class, uh, which develops and um, uses turbines instead of steam engines, it has uh, more guns, uh, it upends this whole strategy. And World War One isn't going to unfold in the way where you'll have a type of battle of midway. But uh, what were the early naval battles like, just to give an idea of how it did unfold? All right, so we'll give a quick survey of some of the key. It's not it's not one of our key battles, but <laughs> these are very minor engagements. But there were a few uh, clashes, if you will, prior to the Battle of Jutland. In the early years of the war, I should say that both British and German admirals used great caution. They didn't want to risk losing their fleets. The these ships are massively expensive. They cost tons of money, and you don't want to lose them. You don't want the admiral who loses a ship or two or three because that's going to probably be the end of your career, and not to mention you're costing many lives and a lot of money. All, all these ships would have hundreds, if not over a 1,000 sailors on them in some cases. So, so they're very careful at first. Uh, the first 
The battle I want to talk about is called the Battle of Heligoland or Heligoland Bight. And it was on August 28th, 1914. So very early in the war. This is the first month of the war. This is this is when the uh, the Battle of Tannenberg in the east, or approximately, uh, uh, that that campaign is going on. And this is when the Germans are just marching through Belgium and then through France, seemingly unstoppable. Uh, it's the first battle of the war in the North Sea. A British fleet commanded by Rear Admiral David Beatty defeated a German fleet. He sank five German ships. And after this, Kaiser Wilhelm ordered that no German ships could go out into the North Sea without his approval. So again, there's that caution there. And there's, there's the fact that Germany is not likely to, uh, you know, to defeat the British Navy, at least not to, not to give them a major defeat. Now let's go to the other side of the world. There's an interesting battle. There was a a German fleet in the Pacific that was going around causing trouble, blowing up things, kicking butt, causing a lot of trouble. They finally made it. They sailed, uh, I guess this would be toward the east, and they were heading over toward South America. And off the south, uh, I, I'm sorry, the west coast, well, I guess there's only a west coast of Chile. <laughs> there's not an east coast. But uh, off the coast of Chile, they – the German Pacific fleet led by a man named Maximilian Spee, they soundly defeated the British fleet. They found a British fleet there, blew the crap out of them. This was the first British naval defeat in a century. Okay. The British, they, they just don't lose, right? British, the British Navy wins all the time, but not this time. But then they got their revenge. Not too long. That was November 1st, 1914. That's called the Battle of Coronel. But about a month later, on December 8th, 1914, this same German fleet, which was the Pacific fleet, but they go around the bottom of South America, the Tierra del Fuego, and they end up on the other side near the Falkland Islands, and they run into another British fleet. And this time, the British do not lose. <laughs> they got their revenge against the German Pacific fleet. They annihilated it, and they killed the commander, uh, Admiral Spee. So... There's a couple of battles, Scott, that you don't – they're in places you don't normally associate with World War One, right, Chile? Yeah, you don't think of the Pacific theater usually. <laughs> no. there. I mean there wasn't much of one, but there was some action there. We're not really going to talk much about it, but I just thought that was interesting that you have these naval battles going on far from Europe. Now, uh, around this time, submarines are getting geared up. The, the Every side had submarines, but Germany is uh, going to be the most famous for using them. Offensively, on September 22nd, 1914, one German submarine, one, sank three British cruisers in one hour. That's an amazing feat. That's how deadly submarines were, or could be at least. In this conflict, 1,450 sailors lost their lives. This is not really, it doesn't have a name of a battle because it's just a single submarine. But later that year and throughout the war, German subs also wreaked havoc in the Baltic Sea. We'll talk a little bit more about submarines later. To protect against submarines, which the Germans called them uh, Unterseeboten, they were undersea boats, um, or we just call them U-boats for short. So when I say U-boat or submarine, those are interchangeable. One time I, I was teaching Scott on World War I, and I started talking about U-boats, and I had a student raise her hand and say, uh, Mr. Early, what is a U-boat? I, I realized I just assumed they knew what that meant. I, so I don't want to assume anything, but we're all here to learn people. No stupid questions. Yes. So to protect against these U-boats, the British blocked off the entrances to Scapa Flow with old ships that they were just sitting there, uh, chains and metal nets. So kind of tightening up there. But in spite of these measures, the U-boats are going to cause a lot of damage, not at Scapa Flow, but in other places. Now, here's another interesting development that happened early in the war. British and Russian sailors found several copies of the German naval code book, which gave the Allied navies the ability to decipher German naval messages. Isn't that handy, Scott? Never change the code. Just leave it lying around. We know this from history listeners. Leaving your code book or secret instructions around, bad idea. Yeah, it, it never seems to work well for the person that leaves it. 
So now it's like the Allies are reading the German mail, so to speak. They're able to decode German messages, and they they know what the Germans are going to do before they did it. I think the British are especially good at this, Scott. They're going to also do it in World War II. Oh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so another thing happens that's kind of something new. In December 1914, a fleet of German ships sailed into the North Sea, and they shelled some towns on the British coast. They shelled Scarborough, famous home of Scarborough Fair. I will not sing the song for you, but maybe another time. Um, they also shelled Whitney and Hartlepool, or Hartlepool, and they killed 137 British civilians. This was the first time in about 250 years that British citizens had been killed on British soil. And that did not do wonders for the PR of the Germans. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just constantly doing things that make them like the bad guy. You know, they're killing Winston Churchill called them baby killers. I mean, the, Ger the, the British were masters of code breaking and they were also masters of propaganda. So yeah, that's not really good. But, and then finally one more battle before we get to the main battle, or we'll, we'll talk about the blockade and then, and then Jutland, but there's a battle on January 24th, 1915 called the battle of Dogger bank. And at this battle, the British fleet drove away the German ships that had been shelling the British coast, as we mentioned. After this, the Kaiser was reluctant to let the German fleet go too far from Germany. Again, we've talked about the caution again and again. The naval war had settled into a stalemate at this point. The British fleet in this battle could have destroyed the German one, but they weren't able to. And the reason they weren't able to was because of a flag signaling error. <laughs> The German, I mean, both navies, in this case, it's the British Navy, they, their communication from ship to ship was still done by flag, just like in the days of Lord Nelson and uh, Trafalgar in the early 1800s, they would send up, flag, there was a flag for every letter of the alphabet, and, but sometimes you couldn't interpret them very well. And so the British fleet pulled back, they misinterpreted the message, and uh, so... <laughs> My kingdom for a flag, right, Scott? <laughs> that would have uh, really changed the course of things uh, significantly. Yeah, there might have been no Jutland. I don't know, but uh, that but the Germans get away again. Well, especially because of the role that naval blockades play and how much they uh, can absolutely hammer one nation and threaten absolutely. to have one drop out of the war altogether. And if Britain could do that more successfully, that could have had a huge impact. And I want to mention a few things here uh, because we're going to be talking about naval blockades. And this is something that Britain, I mean, obviously they didn't come up with this new for this war, but they'd been planning for a possible war with Germany as far back as 1901, as far back as Germany was concocting their invasion plans, Britain was doing the same. And they were examining the threat to their commerce that German surface raiders could cause. Uh, so examinations of the the German threat led to a strategy in 1908 that called for the destruction of the German battle fleet. And the core of this plan was implementing a naval blockade so it could cut off Germany's commerce overseas and deny supplies from neutral European powers uh, by seizing contraband of war and that could be sh reshipped to Germany on neutral vessels. So this specific plan in 1908 called for a close blockade of Germany, uh, a close blockade, uh, which we'll get into more, would force the Germans, they would have to do a sortie, kind of like a, a melee or something to, uh, to pr try to break a blockade and save off economic ruin. Uh, the Britain at least thought that because of their fleet superiority, it would result in victory through a decisive fleet action. This is what they're expecting when the war would happen. Uh, so this plan was altered after 1908 because of technological advances. There's the self-propelled torpedo. There's more efficient mines. This could do terrible damage in a close blockade. So that's why Britain doesn't do this. Um, and we'll talk about what they do do here. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. 
Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. What was it like to watch the Twin Towers collapse on 9-11? How about to be sent to Auschwitz during the Holocaust? Our past has a collection of stories that bring us to where we are and shape our perspectives. Hi, I'm Josh Cohen, host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. On my show, I interview guests who watch the events that shaped our world. From heartbreaking war stories to hilarious memories from the SNL writer's room, no recollection is off limits. To start listening now for free, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search Eyewitness History on the podcast player of your choice. So lead us on, James. What actually unfolds with the naval blockades? Okay, well, I want to start by saying that a naval blockade is not a new thing, obviously. They've been used for, I don't know, since the dawn of war. But when you, if you had a power that had a strong navy... Britain had often used naval blockades in the past against its enemies on the continent. And Germany assumed that Britain would employ uh, what you referred to earlier, a close blockade, meaning that the ships are very close to the coast. But that was not a good idea anymore. Uh, it, it had been okay back in the days of the Napoleonic Wars because you didn't have submarines. But now we do have submarines and, and the self-propelled tor- torpedoes that you were talking about. So these made a close blockade impossible. Britain chose, therefore, to adopt a distant blockade far from the enemy coast. And it worked. The blo- you would think, well, how are you going to blockade if you're so far from the coast? But they managed to do it. The blockade grew increasingly effective over the course of the war, and Germany increasingly feels the squeeze from the lack of goods that they're going to uh, be able to import. In fact... The blockade was such a big deal that the British government established a separate government department. They called it the Ministry of Blockade. And they declared the whole North Sea a war zone. That was of questionable legality. But, (laughs) yeah, you know, (laughs) what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? The Germans had said that the Treaty of London, which respected the neutrality of Belgium, was just a scrap of paper. (laughs) Uh, so <laughs> if they can just throw away that scrap of paper, we can throw away other scraps of paper that say that you can't declare an entire sea to be a war zone, meaning that the British government can do whatever they want there. There's no United Nations. There's no League of Nations going on. Just do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. You know, the, the end justifies the means, at least for the British and for the Germans as well. All right. Who has time for legal niceties? Now, Britain's Navy... The blockade that they did impose got stricter and stricter. They prohibited anyone, even neutral nations, to trade with Germany. And that includes the United States of America. The U.S. was, if they were trying to send things to Germany, the British ships would stop them. And they'd say, you don't want to do that. Why don't you just sell them to us instead? So we've come a long way, Scott. It's not like the days of or in the 1700s and the early 1800s where they they would just take everything. and, And some of the guys, too, right? They're not doing that now, but they are very politely refusing to allow the Americans to trade with Germany as well as other neutrals. And a lot of people in America were not happy about this. But for the most part, America just said, oh, that's fine. No problem. (laughs) Now, at first, the British only intercepted weaponry. That's obviously not acceptable to let people sell weapons to Germany if you're Britain. But gradually, they increased the number of things they confiscated, and eventually they confiscated even food. And and the people wanting to trade with Germany said, that's ridiculous. Food is not a war material. But the British response was, well, actually, if you think about it, it kind of is, because if you sell food to the Germans, where's most of it going to go? 
to the soldiers. And if soldiers eat, then they are able to fight better. So we want the soldiers to preferably not eat if possible. So we're going to try to do everything we can to stop that. German imports and exports plummeted. And the German population and as a whole, the civilians, not just the soldiers, but the civilians had to gradually reduce their caloric intake due to a shortage of food. I read in one source that the average German was consuming only about 1,000 calories a day. I'm not sure how they figure that out. but Ooh, that's starvation rations there. Yeah, they didn't have calorie trackers back then or <laughs> Fitbit or anything like that. But, but yeah, so the poor German people, just the average Joes on the street are getting close to starvation. Almost everything's running out. In fact, they're going to have a winter. We'll talk about this later, but the winter of 26, 20, there I said 20 again, 1916 and 1917 was so brutal uh, and so bad that it was called the turnip winter. The Germans, of course, protested the blockade. They called it evil. They said, hey, th these evil British, they're causing our people to die. Our people are starving and it's all Britain's fault. Germans began to greet each other by saying, <laughs> Not hello, how are you? Good day, you know, guten tag. But they would say, "May God punish England," and the response would be, "Yes, may God punish it." <laughs> really, just a little bit of bitterness there, would you say? Yeah, I would say so. And if you're relying on native-grown produce in Germany, Germany is a northern climate zone, so you would have turnips, cabbage, and um, not much else. Not pretty. Yeah, I'd be pretty mad. If I were stuck with 1,000 calories a day, I'd be pretty mad, too, at the person that caused it. All right. Well, Germany is going to do something. So They are going to do something. Germany is desperate to, number one, to break this blockade. More on that later. But number two, to try to break out of their ports. They've got their this you know pretty decent navy uh, stuck in port and they want to use it. They want to do something with it and they want to try to trap Britain. You know, I, I play a lot of war games and I play a game called Axis and Allies, which is actually a World War II game. But one of the things I try to do is to get my enemy to split their fleet so that I can attack a portion of the fleet with my larger fleet and wipe that out. And then I can turn and attack the other portion of the fleet as well. It's divide and conquer. You know, it's, it's as old as warfare itself. So that's what the Germans are hoping to do. The German naval supreme commander was Admiral Tirpitz. Oh, man, he had epic facial hair, too. <laughs> he would make the Civil War generals proud. Uh, some of them were maybe still alive at this time. General Burnside smiles down on him. Well, Burnside had good sideburns, but not much of a beard. I'm thinking more like Jeb Stewart, Longstreet. <laughs> they would have approved, although they're dead by this time, but... Uh, Tirpitz hoped to lure the British fleet, as I mentioned, into a trap and destroy as much of it as possible. The commander of the German high seas fleet, okay, that's the equivalent of the British grand fleet. The high seas fleet commander was named Admiral Scheer. He wanted to get the British fleet to sail to the Skagerrak, and that is a strait between Denmark and Norway. He was hoping, you know, bring them in, bring them close to us, and then we'll pounce on them. Now, the British Grand Fleet had 28 battleships, nine battle cruisers, 38 light and armored cruisers. Those are a little bit, um, you know, obviously, those are, that's the order of size. Battleships are the biggest. Think, y'all play the game Battleship, right? Raise your hand if you played that. Okay, every hand went yeah, up. Yeah, I see everyone. Yeah. Yeah, we have good eyes. You know, the battleship is the one with four pegs. And then the, uh, I don't think they have a cruiser or do they? I don't know, but they do. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's probably the three peg winner, or maybe that's the destroyer, but it goes like this battleship, battle cruiser, regular cruiser, and then destroyer. So they had 28 battleships, nine battle cruisers, 34 light and armored cruisers and 78 destroyers. So we're talking, you know, well over a hundred ships pushing 150, and it was divided into two parts. So part of the British Grand Fleet was under Sir John Jellicoe, who was the supreme commander of the whole thing. But another part was commanded by Admiral Beatty, who we mentioned earlier. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to this in a minute. But Jellicoe knew of the German plans. We mentioned earlier that they, the British, had cracked the German code. Didn't really crack it. They just found the, the decoder ring, so to speak. <laughs> they found the book. So Jellicoe sent part of the fleet toward the Skagerrak to set a counter ambush. 
So we've got ambush and counter ambush. The Germans are trying to lure part of the British fleet to the south. And the British are saying, yeah, I, I'm game. We'll do it. I'll send part of the fleet down, but we'll send the, the main part of the fleet and keep it pretty close behind. You know, it's the old thing, Scott, when you watch a movie and, you know, let's say 10 guys run up to an enemy force and the enemy force has like 100 or something. And then the, the, the 100 guys chase after the 10 and they're running and they're running. And all of a sudden you look over the hill and there's like a thousand <laughs> uh, of, of the first side just waiting in ambush. It's one of those things. Classic faint maneuver. Yeah, exactly. So and the Germans are going to they're going to take the bait. The German high seas fleet had 16 battleships, six pre-dreadnoughts, which are the older battleships. So really 22 battleships, six battle cruisers. I'm five. I'm sorry. 11 light cruisers and 63 destroyers. So what does that add up to? 20, 38. That's just over 100. So far fewer than the, the British fleet, as you might expect. They would, as I said earlier, they're hoping to isolate part of the British fleet and destroy that part. And that would be a moral victory. And maybe if they get lucky, they can get the other half as well and take it out. Now, they hadn't seen each other at first, but a merchant fleet sailed, happened to sail between the two fleets. And both went to investigate what's going on with this merchant fleet. And there they spotted each other. And combat began at 2.30 p.m. on May 31st, 1916. Those sailors, they're very precise about time. You're not going to get that as much in the other battles, but there it is, yeah. right on the minute. Yeah, that's right. Reminds me of that line in Mary Poppins, like, Britain takes its time from Greenwich, but Greenwich takes its time from Admiral Boom. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> anyway, all right, so that's my bad Dick Van Dyke impression. But <laughs> trying to imitate his bad Cockney accent. Wait, you're saying he wasn't British? I thought he was British all this time. I mean, he just, he, he had me fooled. So, <laughs> All right, so all right. we got a showdown coming here. Two fleets are trying to trick each other, to ambush each other, to set a trap. Let's see how it works out. All right, so I mentioned a minute ago that the British fleet was divided into two parts. A smaller part was under Admiral Beatty, and then the larger part, the main force, which stayed behind, was under Admiral or Sir John Jellicoe. He was an admiral as well. He's the supreme commander of the fleet. So Jellicoe sent Beatty south with a little bit of the fleet, hoping to lure the German fleet back toward the larger fleet, which is the thousand guys over the hill or so. But also the German fleet was divided into two parts because they're hoping to do the exact same thing to the British. The smaller part of the German fleet was under the command of an admiral named Hipper. I didn't put his first name down, not Hipster, but Hipper. <laughs> he had a force of battle cruisers that were detached from the high seas fleet and the British did not see the high seas fleet. Remember, this is a very foggy and misty area. And once you get combat going, these shells often that are fired from the ships, they end up in the, in the water and they throw up these huge spouts of water everywhere. So visibility is tough. There's no sonar, nothing like that. You're just going by eye and you just can't see sometimes. Or sometimes they're just too far away to see. So Hipper... Uh, tries to draw the portion of the British fleet under Admiral Beatty toward the entire German fleet, which was, of course, much bigger than Beatty's fleet. This is what I was talking about earlier. You try to, the Germans are trying to get Beatty, who has a small fleet, to come down and to wander into the path of the entire German fleet, and it'll get blown to bits. That's the German plan. But, of course, Beatty has plans of his own. Beatty takes the bait, no pun intended, uh, and he does, but he knows what he's doing. He follows Hipper, and the two fleets began exchanging fire. By 4.30, the Germans had already sunk three of Beatty's ships, so within a couple hours. That's not good. <laughs> Beatty made a famous statement. He turned to uh, one of his subordinates, and he said, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody <laughs> ships today. <laughs> Classic stiff upper lip remark. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, he doesn't freak out. He just says there's something wrong with our ships. <laughs> what an understatement. Sadly, though, uh, 2,000 British sailors were dead or dying by this time. And then one of Beatty's ships spotted the main German fleet ahead. And they realized, oops, um, we're headed for a trap. So Beatty says, about face, <laughs> forward sail. No, I'm just kidding. I made that up. I don't, I don't know what, but he, he ordered 
his little small group of ships to turn around and head back north. So they're sailing north away from the Germans, but toward the main British fleet, the Grand Fleet. Hipper turned to follow, and so did Scheer, who had the main German force. This is a little confusing, but there's a really great video on this that I recommend, and we'll, we'll put a link to it. It's a, it's a military history YouTube video, and they have great graphics. They show what the ships are doing and everything. It's hard for me to do a mental map on this. but <laughs> Anyway, um, so we got, uh, just to summarize what's happened so far, Beatty, who has part of the British fleet, goes south. He realizes, oops, I'm going into a trap. I'm about to hit the whole German fleet and get blown away. So he turns to the north. Then the Germans follow him. And uh, the, a portion of the Grand Fleet, the first cruiser squadron, arrived and fell on the German fleet, and two British ships were sunk. But then the British do this maneuver, a classic naval maneuver called crossing the T. Uh, and here's how I can explain it. If you visualize the letter T, the British fleet... Uh, deploys itself from east to west. So they're like the bar at the top of the T, okay? And that, so they're all sideways to the Germans, if that makes sense. The Germans are coming straight up like the bottom part of the T, the vertical part of the T. And so the Germans are heading toward these ships that are laid out side by side, and that makes the British ships, they're the top of the T, it gives them the opportunity to direct the maximum amount of fire on these Germans. So now the, the German ships start taking it on the chin. 6.15 p.m., the British opened fire. They inflicted heavy damage on the Germans. The Germans turned around and disengaged. And uh, let me see here. Scheer tries again. He tries to turn back toward the British fleet, but he was overpowered. And he fled again, and he distanced his ships from the British. The British didn't really give a vigorous chase. The next day, the German ships, many of which were heavily damaged, made it to their base. So there it is. That's the Battle of Jutland in a nutshell. It's about, you know, a four-hour battle. That's a little bit shorter than Verdun, right, Scott? <laughs> That's about, um, you could fit about 10,000 of those <laughs> yeah, into the 10, Battle of Verdun. Jutlands time-wise into Verdun, but... But, but the results so, are not insignificant for something that short. Yeah, it's just uh, this is the exception to the rule of these battles taken forever and ever. This one was relatively quick. And there are results. The Germans lost one battle cruiser, one old battleship, four light cruisers, five destroyers, and 2550 sailors. Remember that number of sailors, about 2500, let's say. The British lost three battle cruisers, three armored cruisers, eight destroyers, and over 6,000 sailors. So if you just look at the numbers, you would say the Germans won, right? Because mm -hmm. the Germans lost a lot fewer sailors and they lost fewer ships. But on the other hand, the Germans left the British in command of the field of battle. They, they turned tail and ran and they went back home. So then you could say, well, the British won. And you can especially say the British won in, in that regard because the German fleet is never going to come out again to challenge the British. That's it. They're going to go home and park, and they're done. So the British drove off the last German threat to their supremacy, and they w really will rule the waves from here on. So we could say even though the British lost more ships and more sailors, it was a strategic victory for them. Although it was a tactical embarrassment, you know, there, there's going to be some heads rolling. In fact, Jellicoe is going to lose his job and he's going to be replaced by Beatty as the supreme commander. Jellicoe gets kicked upstairs, so to speak. He becomes the position of first sea lord, which again is actually the second in command of the, <laughs> the department of the Navy, so to speak, the, the ministry of the Navy. He's going to work for Churchill. Well, actually, Churchill, I, I don't know if Churchill's gone by the, yeah, Churchill's gone. So, there's somebody else that is the head honcho of the Navy, which is the Lord of the Admiralty. One more thing, just real quick. And right. this is pretty much the end of the battleship war. So we're not done with naval combat, far from it. But there's just not going to be any more battleship uh, fighting in this war. Yeah, the British really know euphemisms of people who get demoted um, with uh, their titles. But um, yeah, like you said, there's this is a, the massive engagement but it's not quite the engagement that two sides imagined where decisively an entire fleet would be wiped out uh, in the scope of one glorious battle like many assumed 
so they don't risk Germany doesn't risk a high seas fleet in an open battle again. You do see sorties in August and October of 1916, but their surface fleet is mostly inactive in 1917 in favor of something else, which does cause a lot of trouble for the Allies. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. What was it like to watch the Twin Towers collapse on 9-11? How about to be sent to Auschwitz during the Holocaust? Our past has a collection of stories that bring us to where we are and shape our perspectives. Hi, I'm Josh Cohen, host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. On my show, I interview guests who watch the events that shaped our world. From heartbreaking war stories to hilarious memories from the SNL writer's room, no recollection is off limits. To start listening now for free, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search Eyewitness History on the podcast player of your choice. So what is that, James? Yes. So we're now back to the Unterseeboten, or the under... I just like to say German das words. That, yeah, they're, they're so cool. I love the sound of German, even though I don't speak it. But So submarines are going to come to center stage, even as the battleships are going to just kind of fade away. Submarines, we'll give them a full treatment now. They had actually been developed originally primarily by the British. Now, if you've listened to our other series, you know that there was a there was the CSS Hunley in the Civil War, which <laughs> I would not really, want to serve on the Hunley. It has um, no. It, it was really good at one thing, and that's sinking. Uh, <laughs> we'll call it a proto submarine. Even back as far as the Revolutionary War, you had the Turtle which was piloted by one guy, but it was a tiny little thing. He had to get out and then set the charge and it didn't really do anything. But now you have honest to goodness, long range submarines that can travel a long way and they have several, a lot of a big crew on them and they have these torpedoes, which are very deadly. At the beginning of the war, Britain, and France, each had more, each had more submarines than the Germans, but that will change. The Germans are going to build many of them and they're going to use them the most effectively. And so German uh, submarines have become in World War One and become synonymous with the Germans. Now, it was a very specific. Re- there was a specific reason they used submarines. The use of submarines was Germany's way of equalizing the naval war. They were being starved out by the British. The British, as we mentioned earlier, were blockading the Germans, and it was getting tougher and tougher to get anything through to Germany. So they decided they were going to sink enough British merchant fleets to starve Britain into submission. Britain had to import about two-thirds of its food supply. They only grew one-third of their own food. So they really depended on merchant ships to bring in food and other supplies. And the Germans thought, well, it's very simple. If we sink enough of these ships, then the British will also starve and they'll have to quit fighting us. On February 5th, 1915, Germany declared that all seas around Britain were a war zone. And this is a huge sweeping area. We're not talking like, okay, five miles from the coast. No, it's it's a massive amount. I have a map of that and we'll we'll post that eventually. But They said all British ships will be sunk on sight without warning. Now, you may, it it may seem, I remember when I first started studying this, Scott, I thought, well, duh, of course, what else are you going to do? I'm thinking back to my, my war games that I play, you know, (laughs) I'm not going to tell somebody, oh, I'm going to go sink your ship. No, I just do it. Uh, What else would you do? Well, actually there was something else that was done prior to this. There was an ancient custom called cruiser rules, cruiser rules. And this was 
as follows. If you had a ship and you were going about to attack another ship and try to sink it, you would warn them. You would send a message saying, uh, attention, captain or admiral or whoever, you are about to be sunk. So you have, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or thir- not that's too fast, but maybe an hour to evacuate you. So the ship would be warned and they would have the chance to evacuate all their personnel, maybe even some of the goods. And then once the people were safely off, then the attacking ship would blow them to bits. That was the old tradition. But Germany says, we're not going to do that. That's, that's insane because submarines obviously would have to go to the surface, right, to do that. And that was when they were most vulnerable. Submarines were very wimpy when they were on the surface. They were only very powerful when they were under the water. So this is called unrestricted submarine warfare. And it was not popular with the British, and it was not popular with the Americans. It makes them both really, really mad. And then you have the Lusitania, major event. On May 7th, 1915, the British luxury liner Lusitania, kind of like the Titanic, it was sunk by a German U-boat, killing nearly 1,200 people, including 128 Americans. And it wasn't the only such vessel to be sunk uh, but it's the most famous one. In August of the same year, for example, a liner called the Arabic was also sunk. Everybody's heard of the Lusitania, but nobody's heard of the Arabic. Uh, but both of these sinkings, along with others, caused great outrage in Britain and America. By the way, there's a great book on the Lusitania sinking called Dead Wake by Eric Larson, and I recently read it. It's really, really good. Uh, I recommend that to the listeners. Okay. So the subs are causing a lot of problems for the British and starting to see Americans as well. After the, these, these sinkings I've mentioned, the Lusitania, the Arabic, the Royal Navy introduced depth charges. Those are underwater bombs. Those are bombs you drop from a surface ship and they go down and blow up and hopefully take out subs. They weren't all that effective at first, like, like everything. They also, the British also began researching hydrophones, which was a precursor to sonar. And they also began disguising military ships as merchant vessels. I saw a cool documentary on this, Scott. They would take a military ship with guns and everything, and they would hide the guns. They would cover them up and and put them in places where you couldn't see them unless you were on the ship. And they would paint the ship a certain way, and it would look like a merchant vessel. Just, okay, this is somebody coming to Britain to sell stuff. So a U-boat would see it. And they would say, oh, look, let's just pick off this guy. Let's blow him away. And all of a sudden, the um, they would kind of go, surprise, (laughs) and they would unveil the guns. And and they would uh, all of a sudden the the sub realized, oh, crap, this is not this is not a merchant vessel. This is a military vessel. And you would have an honest to goodness fight there. So that I thought that was kind of cool. In September of you know deception and it's kind of the old switcheroo. Yeah, it's kind of like spycraft, you know, in a way, but in in a naval sense. In September of 1915, Germany suspended its policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. They went back to cruiser rules uh, because of international pressure. Admiral Tirpitz resigned in protest. I think his beard also resigned (laughs) just in support of the admiral. But... Uh, that didn't last all that long. That lasted about a year and a half. On February 1st, 1917, Germany was really feeling the squeeze like never before. This was after the turnip winter. They were hungry. They were tired of eating turnips. And they, so they said, doggone it, we are going to start it again. So they resumed the policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. Germany, by this time, had over 100 long-range U-boats. They felt like Unrestricted submarine warfare would choke off trade with Britain and lead to Britain's starvation within six months. It was a calculated risk. They realized that this might tip America over to the side of joining the war on the side of the Allies. But the German leaders felt they had no choice. It's either we do this or we're just going to starve and have to surrender. And believe it or not, it nearly worked. U-boats in Uh, Early 1917, they were sinking several hundred thousand tons of shipping per month in the first six months of 1917. Britain came within three weeks of running out of food. And what did they have to do, Scott? Yeah, uh, so the rationing gets extreme. And um, 
the, it happened before uh, they nearly ran out of food. So in 1915 or 1916, in the run up to this, uh, <laughs> one rule was it was illegal to consume more than two courses while lunching in a public eating place or more than three for dinner. Uh, if you fed pigeons or stray animals, you were fined. Uh, then in January 1917, with unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, voluntary rationing was introduced. So bread is subsidized uh, from September that year, uh, prompted by um, local authorities to take matters in their own hands. There's compulsory rationing that's introduced uh, between December 1917 and February 1918 because Britain's uh, supply of wheat almost runs out. Uh, ration books are introduced for butter, margarine, lard, meat, and sugar. Um, here's an interesting thing, and I don't know what this says about fad diets, if this is um, a carnivore diet or the benefits of intermittent fasting, but rationing benefited the health of the country. So energy intake decreased by 3%, but protein intake increased by 6%. So whatever diet you're on, I hope that um, supports your choice right there. And history is on your side. It's funny. Interesting, huh? I did not know that. Wow. Okay. So yeah, but it doesn't quite work because the British, this idea of starving the British, they come close. But in April of 1917, British, the new British prime minister, David Lloyd George and other leaders ordered the use of the convoy system. And under this system, British merchant vessels would be protected by naval vessels. Now, to me, and maybe to the listeners, Scott, this seems obvious. Like, duh. Mm -hmm. You know, why Why would you not protect these merchant vessels? Remember, merchant vessels are commercial vessels. They're not military ships. They're generally unarmed, although they did arm some of them. But uh, why would you not protect them? But there was a lot of pushback on this. There was a lot of resistance. The The top admirals didn't really want to do this. They were opposed to it because they said that's not a proper use for our ships. You know, it's it's not sexy, so to speak. It's, <laughs> it's just like second class work, I guess. You know, we're just going back and forth protecting these merchant vessels. That's not our job. They would say our job is to go blow up other German, you know, German ships or whoever the enemy is at the time. That's they want to be the next Horatio Nelson. Those are their dreams. It's not escorting a grain boat. Come on. Right. But Lloyd George says, I don't care. I'm tired of losing ships. We're about to starve, guys. And so and it worked very quickly and very well. And by the summer of 1917, only one percent of British merchant vessels were getting sunk. Only one percent. That's way down. I can't remember what the percentage was before, but it was much higher. All right. So that takes us almost up to the end of the war. By August of uh, 1918, so we're getting very close to the end of the war. The U.S. and Britain installed a minefield of over 70,000 mines across the northern part of the North Sea to stop U-boats. And these are this is an elaborate network. There's nets. There's other things. Only, But only six U-boats were destroyed. I think a lot of that is just because the war is only going to last three more months. Um, Interesting side fact here, too, just a, a fun fact, I guess. And I, I don't know if you want to call it fun because we're talking about things being blown up. But um, I read in one source, at least one source, maybe more than one, that more German ships were sunk by mines in the North Sea and other British mines than Allied ships were sunk by U-boats. How about that? Have you ever heard hmm. that, Scott? I have not. That's very interesting. Yeah, you know, the U-boats – are, are famous. Everybody knows about the U-boats and how, how devastating they were to Allied shipping, but people don't think about the British also um, blowing up so many ships with mines. All right. Last thing I want to say, and then I'll hand it to you. At the war's end, the German Navy signed an agreement in which they had to surrender all their ships to the Allies. Say, so, okay, we're going to hand over all of our ships uh, they sailed to Scapa Flow, where they were to surrender. But in June, they sat there for a while. In June of 1919, the Germans scuttled the ships. They said, psych, we're not <laughs> going to hand over our ships to you. We're going to destroy them all. That, that scuttled means they uh, blew them up or, it, or did other things to make them sink and make them be useless. They got on lifeboats and they sailed toward British ships. 
The British opened fire on some of the sailors, killing many German sailors. I was watching a documentary where they actually showed that there's a there's a German naval cemetery near Scapa Flow where these German soldiers who tricked the British, I guess, if you will, they tricked them and did not hand over their ships. They were killed by British. I, guess, I think the British were pretty mad about not getting the ships, you know, and so they took their revenge on the Germans. But I thought that was interesting that there's a German naval cemetery near Scotland. Right. That's, anyway, that, that's fascinating ahead. to see things like things that you don't expect to see or things that shouldn't be there the way that we think things are, but are there. Yeah, that's like the surprise ending of the movie or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't see that coming. Well, uh, that's really interesting you mentioned that episode, and I think that speaks a lot to the lingering resentment after World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, when we get to the end of the series and we look at the Treaty of Versailles, it'll be much clearer, and there are observers who are stating that we've not won a peace. We've won 20 years of armistice, which sounds incredibly prophetic to us, especially the 20 years part, but it was manifestly obvious that uh, – there were unhealed wounds on all sides. There was anger and bitter resentment. Uh, there was not a lasting peace. And this right here is just a, a small episode that illustrates that exactly. All right. Well, we have covered a lot in this episode. We have gone deep underwater and even gone to the Pacific theater of the World War I, which most people didn't know about. The previous episode, we spent a lot of time on the Western Front. In the next episode, Key Battle number 6, we're going to be returning to the Eastern Front and pick up where we left off with Russia and what it's planning to do to launch an offensive after it's smarting from its losses. We look at the Brusilov Offensive.